Yeah, so, this is an interesting article at Breitbart. Breitbart um, has, in many ways, been a mouthpiece for the Trump campaign. So why is Breitbart running um, an article where Vincente Fox is upholding the virtues of NAFTA? That would seem to signal that Trump is going to reverse his position on trade. Or at the very least, that there's a lot of people that are pushing for him to. It's predictable. Um, it's been predictable for a little while. Um, at this point, I, I would not have a lot of confidence in Trump holding to his anti-trade positions. Um, that's a part of the hubris of being a Republican is that you've got to accept the trade, you know. Um, but what, what is the right approach, now that the topic is, has uh, presented itself? I've said this before, what Mexico needs to do is get its labor standards up. It needs more regulation, it needs higher wages, that's the actual ideal here, okay, rather than ripping NAFTA up. It's getting Mexico up to code. If Mexico had comparable wages, standards, and regulations to the United States and Canada, they wouldn't have this labor advantage, and other factors would determine where the factories end up. There's a legitimate level of moral outrage over it, the idea that the comparative advantage is a race to the bottom. I'm no fan of market logic or competitive economies, but you'd get a lot less pushback if the competitive aspect was over who was better and not who was worse. For that reason, this issue is never going to go away. You can throw as many skewed statistics around as you want. You're ultimately not addressing the actual issue. Okay? It may be true that, you know, trade has increased since NAFTA came in. But people that are opposed to NAFTA don't care. That's not their argument. Okay? Their argument is that this is a race to the bottom. There's more trade but lower wages. They want a system that rewards excellence. Not a system that, you know rewards bad labor standards. The, the statistics don't matter. It's, it's a moral question, right? And it's a question of quality of life. You know, I mean, if somebody told you that slavery increased trade, would that justify it? It wouldn't, would it? And, you know, frankly, it's not that far from uh, a reasonable comparison. Um, I'm an anarchist. I, I don't really see a big difference between chattel slave, slavery and wage slavery. Um, and you can get mad, I don't care. Um, but, you know, and when you start talking about really, really low wages, that is, okay? And honest people recognize that. So, would you make the argument? Well, people did make the argument, right? History doesn't look back kindly on them. Now, on the one hand, the argument was always that NAFTA would pull them up to code. On the other hand, everybody always knew that was bullshit. That the point of NAFTA was for the corporations to escape the code. Enough time has now passed to make the following conclusion. If the purpose of NAFTA was to pull Mexico up to code, then it's failed. There's been some progress, sure, but not enough. And this should be the focus from the next president, and perhaps the president after that. So the way this should work is like this. The president should put some demands down on the Mexican political system and provide it with a timetable to meet those demands. I'm not proposing anything onerous, okay? Only that Mexico bring itself up to code that it's the same standards that the United States and Canada has so that there's an even play playing field across the three countries. Should it meet those demands, NAFTA can stay. Should it reject them, NAFTA must end. But I want to be clear that I don't think the failure here is at a legislative level, okay? It's not something you should ever expect any president or any parliament to pass, okay? And nobody seriously ought to expect that a parliament will pass these kinds of laws without pressure from below. I know that Mexico has a history of labor repression, but newsflash, so does the United States. And in fact, so does Canada. There may be a difference of scale, but why has Mexican labor not risen up and demanded more? Where are the Mexican consumer watchdog groups? Where is the Mexican left? Now, if you know a little bit about what, the way the Mexican state works, you can answer that question, right? It's bogged down in bureaucracy, but, you know, like, there need, I, I think I think the, the major error that's come out of NAFTA is that the American left has not funded the, the, the Mexican left. That's the answer, 
and it's mind-boggling to me that it hasn't been done. Okay, the AFL-CIO should be sending tons of money to Mexico to fund sit-down strikes, okay, to fund walkouts in order to get get things back up. Now I know that the Mexican legal system can be brutal. Okay, I know that the system is very corrupt. It's crony from the top down. Okay, but you don't fix it unless you fight back. And there needs to be solidarity. Okay, that's the great success of NAFTA from the capitalist perspective is that they found a way to get Mexican workers fighting against American workers. And that rhetoric is it's entrenched on the left, and that's why that's why we've lost. Okay, that's why the word that's why the left lost, because instead of building solidarity across these groups and working together. They bought into it, and they saw each other as competitors, and they fought against each other. If they all work together, they can increase Mexican living standards. And once they do that, then there's nothing to fear from free trade. In fact, it's very progressive to have open trade, open borders, if the standards are comparable. I think that the bottom line is that they've had enough time to get this sorted out. Okay, you can talk of you, you can know what's bullshit, okay, but you don't need to have that argument anymore. You don't have to argue that it's bullshit. Okay? You can you know, allow the facade and conclude that it failed. Okay? It should have it should have been sorted out by now. They should have increased their labor standards by now. They haven't. Maybe they can't. It's not happening either way. Okay? So, it needs to be, you know, pressure or bust. They need the pressure from the outside. Hard pressure. Under serious consequences. The abolition of NAFTA would really hurt Mexico at this point. Okay? And so there's a lot of leverage there. To force the Mexican government to better its standards. And if they won't do that, then the agreement must be abolished. Now, what's the likelihood of getting a president in place that's going to think like that? Almost zero. It's the right approach. It'll never happen. The real solution is to get money from the wealthier American unions to funnel it into Mexico and organize. But that itself is... The, the American left has become... you know, Or the American Union movement has been totally... It, it's, it's become a bourgeois system, right? The union movement in Mexico might be bureaucratized and very difficult to work within. But the union movement in the United States is bourgeois, okay, and it they're fat and lazy. It's the truth. That's why everything was taken from them, because they were too fat and lazy to fight. You don't have to like that, okay, but you should bloody well accept it. It might be the only real answer, okay, but I don't think that looking at the American Union movement and looking for action there is truly going to be any more fruitful than looking at the Mex Mexican one. The strongest union movement, the strongest left, is actually in Canada. But can we generate sufficient funds? Can we radicalize movements in the States? This is not getting better uh, unless, unless workers fight. And uh, that organization has to happen. Right? But, I mean, what should, they, what should the president do? That, that's what it should do. Whether it's likely to happen or not. Alright, so it's around 4 o'clock, 
Um, I guess I woke up around noon. Uh, had some pizza. Um, haven't really done anything today. Um, I'm going to, uh, I haven't got a call, um, back from, uh, the drugstore yet. So, um, today's the day I'm going to go in and do it. Um, give them a hard time. I'm going to have to. Um, I'm going to stop at the food basics first, obviously. See what uh, they say, and then uh, head out there. Um, and, uh, well, we'll see what happens. Um, I will bring this with me, as I will no doubt be ranting. Um, but, uh, I guess I'm going to figure out uh, what I'm doing with the prescription, um, what kind of explanation they have, um, and etc. Well, Food Basics is in between. It's seventy-three dollars and one cent, but they wouldn't charge for the one cent because there's no pennies. Um, although they would because it's over over debit. We, we had that discussion on the site. Anyways, um, so it's seventy-three dollars there. It was sixty-six. Uh, or actually, it was what it was. It was it was less over. Yeah, it was like sixty-two or something there. Huh? See, I go to the PC every month anyways, right? That's a bit of a... You know what I should do? I should try and figure out what my, what my GST is um, coming up. Uh, I think, like I say, I, th I think it switches in July. Meaning I'll have one month in between, right? So, if my GST comes up and it's... Um, above, if it's more than 73, then it works out, right? Um, otherwise I'm paying. Uh, but I... See, it's been going up periodically, so if it's going to go up, it's going to go up. And you want to go to the cheapest place, so when it goes up, it's going to go up less. Yeah. If it was like a dollar or 50 cents, but $10 is... It's significant, right? Ten dollars is worth a walk that I'm gonna make every month, anyways. Yeah. The only thing is, I'm thinking like, what about the winter? I wonder if they even mail it. No, that doesn't make sense. I have to go pay for it. Yeah. Let's see what they say here at the shoppers. Um, the shoppers will not be the cheapest. Uh, shoppers are known to be a little bit more expensive. Um, like, like it, that's like across the board on everything. So I need to expect that. But uh, it's still a very large increase out of the blue. And I also need to. Um, I also need to verify that. Yeah, fuck off. What? I also need to. Fuck off. I'm walking away from you. Can you not see that I'm walking away from you? Assholes. Anyway, so I'm also gonna need to check. Um, To, to, to make sure that um, the price that they had down there was up, was, was like up to date, right? So it's good to wait a few more days, probably, before I think about moving. Um, if we wait till mid month. That'll be good to know, All right? So rather than give me an explanation as to why it's so much here, um, they tried to to, to uh, argue that. I should expect it to go up um, by the same amount elsewhere. Um, it is $15 more here than anywhere else. Um, or $10 more here than anywhere else, anyways. Um, and uh, they don't they don't have an answer. So um, I'm gonna wait until around the 15th um, before I go back to the PC store. Uh, see what they say, um, 
if they're still telling me it's the same amount, then uh, I'll switch. Um, I think that that's uh, the, the best thing I'll have to do. Um, now here's the other thing. Um, they might be telling me that um, it'll go up when they run out of stock, right? It might be a while before um, they run out of stock. So if that's the case, I might, you know, bounce around from pharmacy to pharmacy um, until they do run out of stock. Um, I mean, if that's true, then it makes sense for me to go to the other pharmacy until they run out and then move to a different pharmacy until they run out and et cetera, et cetera, right? So um, I'm also going to want to like, when they tell me it's 73 at the Walmart, that's kind of halfway in between, right? So is that 73 reflective of the new price or the old price? Is it a little bit less um, for the new price or is it a little bit more for the old price, right? So um, I think that uh, either way, um, the shoppers has moved out of my price range, right? So, um, one way or the other, I'm going to have to get out of the shoppers. I think that's pretty clear. Um, so, for example, one, one way I might do this is I might go to the PC until they run out of stock. And that might take a year. Who knows? Um, and then move to the food basics, right? Um, the shoppers is, uh, shoppers is out, I think. So, um, I got my census letter in the mail today. Um, if you are familiar with Canadian politics, that was kind of a big deal. The previous government cancelled the census. Everybody thought that was crazy because then they didn't have any data. And how do you make policy without data? Uh, well, I guess if, you, if, you're, if you're a true believer and a total ideologue, you don't need data, right? Because... God has all the answers, or some crazy thing like that, right? Uh, you don't have any faith in markets, do you? I always love getting that one. Right? Have you no faith in markets? Um, but yeah, that's... Uh... Anyways, the census is in. I gotta go online and fill it out. Hey, I'm saving paper that way. Um, I don't know how... You know what? I have actually never completed one of these things before because it was cancelled like 10 years ago and I'm just not old enough. So I get to experience the joys of filling out a census for the first time. Let's see how that goes. Newt Gingrich for vice president. <laughs> you know, I think Marilyn Houston would be a better VP pick. Might balance out the identity politics a little. She's the... Um, CEO of Lockheed Martin. And um, if you didn't know it, that's, uh, that's what Newt is. Newt, Newt Gingrich is a lobbyist for, for Lockheed Martin. That's his, uh, that's his job. Picking Gingrich would certainly send a message, but that message is something like, eh, you might as well vote for Ted Cruz, because that's what you're getting. It's the establishment flying in. Um, Gingrich is the same fake outsider, right? Cruz pretended he was outside the establishment. Everybody knew he was, you know, standard bearer politician, getting all his money from Goldman Sachs and etc. Gingrich is, in many ways, the forerunner to Ted Cruz. He's um, Ted Cruz's uh, protege, whether they ever spoke or not. Um, protege from a distance. Uh, he's the... Um, He's a template, right? In fact, there was something that Newt did that, 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 that Cruz followed in his footsteps with. And we should really have a hipster meme for it. We need a picture of Newt. I shut down Congress before it was uncool. I'll admit this, though. A Cruz Gingrich ticket is bad enough that I'd happily vote for Hillary. You'd expect them to go on strike or something. Listen, it ought to be crazy talk. It's nuts, okay? But you're batshit to try and read any sense into the campaign. 
who knows what they're gonna do. I think that uh, Trump Gingrich would be get around 33, maybe 35 percent of the vote in 2016. It would be like, you know, and considering that the opponent is Hillary Clinton, you'd like lock into pattern everybody over 50, right? And you may, I, I, I think that young people may spontaneously combust on mass. Um, at, at, at the idea of this. You know, th there were a lot of good things in the 90s that, you know, should be repeated, but Newt Gingrich is not one of them, and nor is Hillary Clinton for that matter. Well, Hillary was a lot better in the 90s. Uh, and in fact, I think we can make the argument that Gingrich is a lot better now than he was in the 90s. But um, this is, it's, it, I, I, I can't even, like, I can imagine halfway through the campaign, Gingrich trying to shut down the process. I think that's what might happen. He just decided that we're not going to have an election. Maybe, maybe that's Barry's secret plan. Uh I'm on to him. Now I got it. He gets Gingrich to run with Trump. Then Gingrich shuts the election down, and you've got Obama for another eight years. That's the only way I can make sense of this. So what's today's Hillary? Well, um, the, the headline says something about how she's appalled about, um, how some Republican senators sent some letters to the, to the Ayatollah, um, which is like, whatever. Um, but, um, what I'm more interested in, um, is how she talks about, um, the need for, uh, a bipartisan, um, foreign policy that is the same amongst Democrats and Republicans. Which, if you interpret that properly, um, really means to state that um, she wants both parties um, to follow the interventionist, you know, neocon foreign policy, right? Uh, she wants stasis, stability, um, and as though, you know, elections don't matter. Um, really, I think that when you think about it for a second, what she's really calling for is um, the abandonment of civilian control of the military, right? If you want the policies to be the same in both parties, then that can only really happen if it's the military that's really making the decisions, right? And uh, again, that's consistent with a lot of other things she said, um, and actually consistent with what we've seen happen uh, since about 1980. Maybe a little bit, well, since, I guess since, Viet, since the end of Vietnam, um, is uh, the slow um, removal of civilian oversight. Um, I, had a, I had a react about this, about how uh, what, we what we hear and what the discourse is, is the question of the loss of um, congressional oversight what the actual real story is um, is not that the executive power is taking control away from Congress but that the military itself because the executive doesn't make a lot of those decisions, right? It's the military that does. And she seems to be in support of that. Which is of no surprise. Right? It's uh, consistent with everything else she ever, she's ever said on the topic. And um, there's a Brookings Institute talk where she talks about her five pillars. Um, it's all very much expected. Um, it's it's a lengthy and uh, rather than uh, deconstruct it, um, I mean, I, 
it would be a long deconstruction, and I don't think um, it's really worth it, because uh, it, it's all very expected. I'll just leave you with a link there, and uh, you can go ahead and uh, see it yourself. Um, that's what you expect, you know. Uh, and it's actually recent. That's from 2015. Um, you know, you know, get tough on the Iranians, you know, blow the hell out of them. Um, you know, go after Assad, you know, you don't want regime change, you know, protect Israel. Um, actually, she says at one point that, you know, give Israel the most advanced military weapons that they have. It, it's just, you know, neocon wet dream. Every crazy nonsensical thing you can think of, it's all in there, right? So it's 4 a.m. somehow. I don't know. What did I do today? Woke up around noon. I had a couple of pieces of pizza. Sat down. Read a few things. Then went out. Got my pills. And some information. Got back around. I don't know what time is it. Left five. Did the survey, which was short and not particularly painful. Watched a two hour vlog from a few days ago. Did a little bit of editing. Got something to eat. And now it's four. So I guess I lost a day to edit. Um, I guess that's a consequence of the last few days. Yeah. Because I just finished editing the, the the two hour vlog was from Sunday. And then I was kinda comatose for two days. I was uh, I was recovering. My feet were very sore. Um I did a lot of sleeping. And, uh, I didn't get around to editing that until today, so. I guess that's the consequence of that. So be it. I am still debating, um, whether I want to go to the show tomorrow or not. Um, I gotta listen to that band a little bit more. It, it's weird, it's like... Okay, so, if you go back to, like, the early 70s, there were all of these, like, late and prog bands, like, Gentle Giant. And they sang songs about magical fairies and forests, and they had, like, flute parts in their songs. And everybody made fun of them because they were a bunch of pretentious doofuses, right? Um, now, if you can imagine that sort of idea, but done by people that aren't really musicians and are kind of making fun of it. So it's like postmodern fantasy prog. It's at a specific venue that has to, that, that, that would never never let a prog band play. Actually, that's not true. But they've never let anybody that calls themselves prog play. So they, they, they have to use the word punk because it's the venue. But nonetheless, um, this has more to do with with Genesis than it does with with the dead Kennedys. Sorry, it's the truth, and and I know it. Um, see, I know that if I go, I'm gonna laugh, and, and that's kind of my my point. Um, I just wish there were better bands at the festival. It's kind of iffy. See, if I go, I'm going to want to go for the day. Because there's a festival. And, you know, I'll pay $10 if I go just Saturday. And I pay 15 if I go Friday and Saturday. Right, so. Pay an extra 5 bucks and go you know, sit in the sun for a bit. I guess the weather will have something to do with it. And, and it's going to be more like what I feel like when I wake up, right? If I feel like going, I'll go. If I don't feel like going, I won't. Easy. Easy peasy. Right? Did I just say that? I think it's time to go to sleep. I'm getting crazy.
predictable attempt to relive lost glory years after falling and fading into irrelevance. A little paranoid android much, eh? Hey? It's good that Tom has realized that he does require Johnny to make a good record. It wasn't clear over the last few years whether he realized that or not. He seemed to think that he can make a good record with Flea or, you know, just him and Nigel Godrich. Um, and, and it was missing um, a certain um, musical abstraction that um, is very much uh, connected with the uh, the orchestrations that uh, Johnny Greenwood um, is known for. So it's good that he's realized that he needs, he needs Johnny. Okay, Tom without Johnny isn't going anywhere. But it's egos clashing. It's not collaborative. Tom is really doing everything he possibly can to drown out the strings, which um, very much have Johnny's um, signature um, within them. An epic mix manages to save a catastrophe. Although, I'm sure there's more than one patch on that processor. Um, I'm talking about the vocal effects. We've heard quite a lot of that one. This isn't going to turn out well if the process is that Tom shows up after Johnny's done all the work, like it's just another side project, and howls out some half-formed nonsense. Let's be honest here, he couldn't even be bothered to write a second verse. A band is supposed to be collaborative. That's the point. I don't know how they can go on for over a decade without remembering that. But I'm not disappointed. I am too far gone to be disappointed. I'm jaded. Cynical, even. I've been so over this band since 2003. Really. But there's actually a bit of a tease here that we haven't heard in a while. It's actually new material. It's not just the same recycled sound they've been stripping down forever to the point of parody. They actually are doing something different here. And it sounds like they're disjointed, you know, and everything else. But that's um, that's a silver lining here, okay? But if he wants to go down this orchestral path, I wish he'd be a little more aspirational. I mean, it's not like it's avant-garde. Listen to Eleanor Rigby, for fuck's sake. Or, or How to Disappear Completely and Never Be Found. This just seems a bit pedestrian in comparison. But if moaning about Radiohead were an Olympic sport, I'd be competitive. I've been doing much moaning about Radiohead for many years. Um, and, and, and I'm quite good at it. Actually, it's 7 o'clock and I'm somehow still awake. Um, and again, all I've done really um, over the last couple of hours is just mess around on the internet and uh, I do some editing. Um, I seem to be like really kind of like, like, like flippanty. A lot of it's like, like the temperature is like, it seems like he's got the air on. I'm not sure. I think maybe he turned it off like late last night. Right, but it seems like that's like like the air conditioner has been on uh, during the day and will probably be on again today. Um, so I need to have the heat on because otherwise it's going to be like freezing down here, right? We went, we went over this. It might say that it's like 20, but it'll feel like it's like 15 because there's like the the heat sucking, right? So like my my, my perspective is that like air condition. I don't really like air conditioners at all, but that they're not inherently evil, right? They can have a use if it's like 30 degrees out, right? You don't, like, in my mind, like, you don't even think about turning the air on until it gets, like, at least above 25 out, right? Like, when you've got days where it's like 18, 19, 20 degrees, those aren't air conditioner days. Those are days when the heat is still arguably on, right? So, I'm left in this situation I don't really want to be in, right? I want to turn the heat off, but I can't if the air is on. It's just not warm enough outside, <laughs> right? It, it, it's it's too cold out for the air, so I need to have the heat on. Um, and that's doing weird things to me. Um, it did weird, it, it always does. Well, I, th I think that would do weird things to most people 
because you're being like, you know, and there's fans going and they're being sucked around every way, and it's just like, uh, I don't know. Again, I need to reiterate that my my game plan here is that I will outlive the person above me, uh, and uh, things will get better after that. Um, I don't know how much longer. He can't be in great shape. I don't want to be an asshole, but I mean, that's the honest truth. Um, if his brother's in his late 60s, he can't be that much younger. So, and he's not healthy. <laughs> so, you know, it's like, he's got to be getting to life expectancy, you know. Like, again, I don't want to be an asshole, but it's the truth of it. And, you know, if, if, if it was anything else, I'd be thinking about getting out of here. Because um, the temperature is legitimately uncomfortable at times. Um, but I mean, I, I, it's the only way to deal with it is, is to turn the heat up, right? I, but then I get really dry and I can't sleep because I'm dry. And I've decided I'm not going to the show tonight. Um, I would go if it was around the corner, right? But it's too much of a pain in the ass, and I don't, I don't, I don't want to go to the, you know. Um, like I say, if there were, if there were better acts at the, at the festival, I would more uh, strongly consider it. Um, but, uh, no. I will go on Saturday for sure. Um, I'm I'm interested in the last band, which is a band from Boston called Pile. I'm just going to show up at one and just, like, watch all the bands and see what happens. Uh, <laughs> um, and uh, then pretty much the go home after. Um, I just, I don't, uh, like I said, I, I, I would stop by if, if, if I, if the other stuff was better, but it's just, it's not, it really isn't, it's, uh, it would be, it would, it would just be a waste, a waste of everything, uh, a waste of, a waste of time, a waste of money, a waste of blood cells, uh, I meant to say brain cells, but not at a waste of blood cells as well. And, uh, ultimately, I guess, it, it would just be a waste of, I was going to say a waste of beer, but I wouldn't be drinking beer. Just a waste. All, all, all around. I'm silly. Um, you can guess I'm probably tired. So, um, I'm going to do some more editing. I'm almost caught up. Um, and, uh, I can't let this happen. <laughs> i got to stay on top of this. Um. At the least, if, if I get everything done before I go to sleep, then I can wake up in the morning or in the afternoon and just be like ready, right? And that's what I want. Let's do that. Um, another waste of day, but uh, I'm getting to, getting to the end of those. I promise.